Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Dear students, you are welcome in this class. Topic of this lecture is Physiological Principles and the Efficient Co-Production in Dry Land. The learning objectives are to define the various kinds of physiological functions and principles necessarily required by the dry lands for survival. In dry land, we definitely have shortage of moisture and how and why these physiological principles can be applicable. Describe the techniques necessary to sustain the production and productivity of crops under dry land conditions. So some glossary, agricultural drought, there are different kind of drought, meteorological drought, hydrological drought and uh, see what is agricultural drought. Agricultural drought occurs when rainfall amounts and distribution, soil water reserves and evaporation losses combine to cause crop or livestock yields to diminish markedly. Air pollutant, foreign and or natural substances occurring in the atmosphere that may result in adverse effect to humans, animals or the surrounding environments. Uh, climate, fluctuating aggregate of atmospheric conditions characterized by the states and development of the weather of a given area. Dehydration avoidance. It is the strategy of the plants that are able to maintain tissue water potential as long as uh, high as possible under drought conditions. Uh, dehydration tolerance. It is the strategy of the plants that are able to cope with severe tissue dehydration. Drought. A period of abnormally dry weather sufficiently prolonged for the lack of water to cause a serious hydrological imbalance that is crop damage in the affected area. Dry period, the time over the year which is characterized by the precipitation being lower than half the evapotranspiration and which therefore does not belong to growing period. Evapotranspiration uh, you, you must be knowing, it is total of the losses of water by evaporation and transpiration combined together. Dry land farming, crop production without supplementary irrigation in semi-arid regions and therefore dependent on precipitation. Precipitation is generally your rainfall. Dry land farming requires the capture and efficient use of precipitation. Growing season, the period of the year when most crops are grown, the rainy season under dry land conditions. Hydrological cycle describes the continuous movement of water on, above and below the surface of the earth. Length of growing period, the continuous period of the year when precipitation exceeds half of penman evapotranspiration plus a period required to evapotranspire and assumed soil moisture reserve and when mean daily temperature exceeds 6.5 degrees Celsius. Osmotic stress. The stress imposed on a plant by the accumulation of high concentration of salt around the root, which reduces plant growth. Particulate matter. Any material that exists in the solid or liquid state in the atmosphere. The size of particulate matter can vary from coarse, wind-blown dust particles to fine particles. Now see uh, the map of India and, and these are the areas uh, colored in brown, brown color and you can see these are the rain fed region in the country. See very large area is under rain fed conditions. Why arid and semi arid farming is our concern? Semi and arid uh, farming here mostly dry land farming. Why it is a concern? Because it is about 58 percent of the net cultivated area is occupied by the dry lands and food production is about 44 percent. Uh, th this is uh, important to know that area is very high, 58% of the total cultivated area. 
but contribution in food production is 44, which is a mismatch. And human population residing here is 40 percent and animal population is 60 percent. Pulses and millets 87 percent come from these areas. Oil seeds about 77 comes from these lands and cereals 50 percent and cotton 66 percent. About 325 million ton of food grains for 1.5 billion population by 2025 is to be produced by the country. And in that case, uh, to sustain this food security, these rain-fed land, dry lands, land, dry lands will have great responsibility. Now, see potential of rain-fed and dry land agriculture. Still, we are not realizing the best of the yields, and they are less than the actual or observed yield. So, you see, in India, we are getting hardly 40 percent of the uh, of the possible yield, and rest is the gap. Now, see yield gap of important rain-fed and dryland crops in different countries. So, you see in for soybean, for groundnut, for kharif, kharif sorghum, etc., the yield, a big yield gap exists in the country for different crops. See this case also. In this case, cereals, a big yield gap, the blue color is national demonstration, we got, and the red one is which is being achieved, uh, which is the national average of the rain-fed land or dry lands. So, you see there is a big gap, there is big difference between blue and red. So, we need to raise this red. Now, come to the main topic that is dry land farming. So, dry land farming and dry farming encompasses specific agricultural techniques for the non-irrigated cultivation of crops. Dry land farming is associated with dry lands areas characterized by a cool wet season which charges uh, charges the soil and with virtually all the moisture that the crops will receive prior to harvest followed by a warm dry season they are also associated with arid conditions area those having scarce water resources so dry land are the areas where there is shortage of water or deficit of water and these reasons mainly fall in arid and semi-arid climate. So, farming under these conditions, under dry land condition is dry land farming. So, dry land farming has evolved as a set of techniques and management practices used by farmers to continually adapt to the presence or lack of moisture in a given crop cycle. Now, constraints of uh, crop production in dry lands. So, there are number of constraints in dry land which stop or by which we realize the less yields. So, reasons are inadequate and uneven contribution of rainfall. This is the topmost reason for low productivity in dry land. We are not sure when rain will come and when it will end. So, there are a lot of uh, problems related to onset of monsoon, distribution of, of rain, etc. Late onset and early cessation of rain, this can happen. A prolonged dry spells during the season, this is a common cause of concern that for long part of the year, dry conditions exist and very few rainfall is there. Hot dry winds, low humidity, excessive evaporation. Excesses, ev excessive evaporation, particularly during summer month, it exceeds the uptake of the water by the crop. Low moisture retention capacity, soils are generally light in texture. So, they, they, they are basically not supposed to store more moisture. Low fertility of soils, salinity and alkalinity, this is another issue under arid and semi-arid climate that many so soils, large chunk of soils are salt affected, saline or alkaline in nature. Rapid runoff, undulated topography, because soil is mostly light textured and, uh, and also some medium textured soils are also there. So, rapid runoff occurs, they do not retain water for long time. Uh, poverty and small holding size, this is socio-economic issue and because of these conditions, people in those areas are poor. Improper variety selection, poor crop establishment and weeds. There are number of issues which are related to crop management. So, there is no efficient crop management by the farmers, so could be the reason or constraint. Now, see some constraint in detail. 
dry lands are characterized by low and uncertain rainfall therefore crop failure is a common feature there the various constraint of dry land include in dry land areas in general the rainfall is low and highly variable which results in uncertain crop yields the distribution of rainfall during the crop period is uneven receiving high amount of rain when it is not required and lack of it when crop needed so that is that is the issue and not just in dry land that is common everywhere uh, where the farming is dependent upon the monsoon we do not know uh, when it will come and when will it will go how much it will rain today how much it will not rain generally in dry land areas when the monsoon sets in late the sowing of crops are delayed resulting in crop yields so many many things are related to uh, rainfall in in case of dry land agriculture or at times the rains may cease very early in season exposing the crop to drought and during flowering and maturity stages which reduces the crop yields considerable so these flowering and maturity stages are very very important particularly flowering at which there should not be any shortage of moisture if shortage occurs then definitely it will affect the grain filling seed setting and so on so soils of the dry lands are not only dry but also deficient in macronutrients means there are number of uh, soil fertility issues soil erosion is there and they are less uh, in organic matter content contained nitrogen phosphorus and some of the micronutrients are deficient in these soils the temperature in dry land varies greatly during the period of moisture stress and drought the temperature accelerate the crop development resulting into forced maturity that is another issue physiological issue when your crop is flowering or at, at uh, grain filling stage suddenly there is rise in temperature or shortage of moisture it will definitely lead to uh, shorten the life cycle of the crop which will result in reduced yields so dry land areas suffer from various processes of soil degradation especially soil erosion so lot of soil is lost by so, so, uh, the soil erosion mainly by wind or water A small size of land holding less than 2 hectares usually fragmented and scattered lack of market facilities frequent crop failure poor economic condition and other socio economic problem related to dry lands so small land hold holdings are also another limitation or constraint in dry land areas extremely poor condition of the farmer and lack of infrastructure to boost the production uh, effect of drought or water deficit on physiological or morphological characters of the plant so lot of physiological changes occur due to excess temperature or high temperature or shortage or deficit of water or sometimes there are droughts in those areas so first of all see what what happens to the water relations so alters the water status by its influence on absorption translocation and transpiration so these are physiological uh, activities in the plant the lag in absorption behind transpiration results in loss of turgor as a result of increase in the atmospheric dryness photosynthesis is reduced by moisture stress due to reduction in photosynthetic rate chlorophyll content leaf area and increase in assimilates saturation in leaves due to lack of transport translocation so therefore if photosynthesis is reduced so will be the biomass and finally the economic yield or grain yield of the crops now respiration increase with mild drought but more severe drought lowers water content and respiration this is another issue that high temperature and shortage of moisture leads to increased rate of respiration that means lot of carbohydrates will be lost quickly by way of respiration and plants dry matter may decrease anatomical changes decrease in size of the cells and intercellular spaces thicker cell wall greater development of mechanical tissue stomata per unit leaf area tend to increase metabolic reaction all almost all metabolic reactions are affected by water deficit whether it is protein synthesis rna synthesis dna synthesis whatever it is there they all are affected due to shortage of water 
then certain hormonal relationship under these conditions, activity of growth promoting hormones like cytokinin, gibralic acid and indolestic acid decreases and growth regulating hormones like FCC acid ethylene increases. So, it is happening other way around means we wanted that these ethylene and FCC acid should be less and others should be more so that growth of the crop is enhanced, but it is happening uh, towards other side. Nutrition, the fixation, uptake and assimilation of nitrogen are affected since dry matter production is considerably reduced, the uptake of NPK is also reduced. So, under most of the conditions when water is deficient, the nutrients are transferred by way of mass movement of ions or by diffusion. So, both are mostly water dependent and due to shortage of water, nutrient transport to root is affected and so is the case of uptake. The growth and development, decrease in growth of leaves, stems and fruits, maturity is delayed if drought occurs before flowering, while it as advances if drought occurs after flowering. So, this is point worth noting. Reproduction and grain growth, drought at panicle initiation in cereals is critical while drought at emphasis may lead to drying of pollen. Drought at grain development reduces yield while vegetative and grain filling stages are less sensitive to moisture stress. So, this statement says that flowering or initially the reproductive development in the plant are most critical stages for moisture. Now, what happens to yield? The effect on yield depends hugely on water proportion of the total dry matter is considered as useful material to be harvested. If it is aerial and underground parts, effect of drought is as sensitive as total growth. Uh, when the yield consists of seeds as in cereals, moisture stress at flowering is detrimental. When the yield is fiber or chemicals, where economic product is a small fraction of total dry matter, moderate stress on growth does not have uh, adverse effect on yields. So, effect of water deficit or moisture uh, stress is also depend dependent upon kind of economic product. So, if it is the whole biomass, then it is less affected and if it is mainly the grain, then it is more, uh, more affected. Now, physiological principles for yield improvement in dry lands or dry land crops. So, we know palmlet and sorghum are C4 crops and the legumes uh, groundnut, chickpea and pigeon pea are C3 crops and they occupy an important crops in dry ar uh, arid and semi arid tropics. So, in these regions, these are the really important crop palmlet, sorghum, certain legumes like groundnut, chickpea and pigeon pea. And among them, some are C4 and some are C3 plant. C4 plant means when photosynthesis happens, the first product of photosynthesis is 3 carbon compound in, in C3 plant and 4 carbon compound in C4 plants. So, therefore, it, they are called C3 and C4 plant. Generally, C3 plants have photorespiration, losing their synthesized carbohydrates of photosynthesis and C4 plants do not have this mechanism of photo uh, respiration. Therefore, C4 plants ha have higher photosynthesis efficiency compared to C3 plants. So, the C4 plants have higher photosynthetic capacity and are more efficient in nitrogen and water use efficiency. So, it is worth mentioning that these plants, C4 plants have higher water use efficiency also means they can do better under water stress environment compared to C3 plants. The legumes fix nitrogen through symbiotic association with rhizobium bacteria and compensate to a large extent for their lesser water use efficiency. Global warming due to climate change will affect grain yields more so in tropical than in temperate regions. So, as you already know that dry lands are already facing uh, uh, hotness or, or hot weather many times and these climate changes will affect it further. Reproductive traits are highly sensitive to high temperature leading to yield reduction. Now, crop productive, uh, productivity versus survival mechanism in dry lands. So, response of most crops to soil water deficit 
can be described as a sequence of three successive stages of soil dehydration means starting from sufficient water availability to the least water availabilities so there are three different phases of water availability and growth so stage 1 it occurs at high soil moisture when water is still freely available from the soil and both stomatal conductance and water loss are maximal so here there is no problem for water deficit and the transpiration ration rate during this stage is therefore determined by environmental conditions around the leaves higher the temperature higher may be the respiration lower the temperature lower will be the transpiration it is transpiration stage 2 it starts when the rate of water uptake from the soil cannot match the potential transpiration rate so here the problem starts when the losses of water by et or evapotranspiration are more and uptake is less so stomatal conductance declines to keep transpiration rate similar to the uptake of soil water for maintaining the water balance of the plant so this is this is the internal mechanism of the plant when losses of water exceed the uptake then plant tries tries to control the transpiration by by reducing the size of the stomata stage 3 it begins when the ability of stomata to adjust to the declining rate of water uptake from the soil has been exhausted now stomata cannot play more role it cannot constrict itself further more and stomatal conductance is minimal so that is that is that is a serious stage virtually all major processes contributing to crop yield including leaf photosynthetic rate leaf expansion and growth are inhibited late in stage 1 or in stage 2 of soil drying so losses actually start from the stage, uh, later part of the stage 1 and continues in stage 2 and there may be maximum losses if stage 3 reaches because in stage 3 the growth or photosynthesis will be severely affected and plants may have more respiration that time at the end of stage 2 these growth supporting processes have reached zero and no further growth occurs in the plant the focus of stage 3 is just survival and water conservation essential for the plant to endure these uh, severe stresses plant survival is a critical trait in dryland ecosystems but most agricultural situation stage 3 has little relevance to increasing crop yield and water productivity because here there is no possible the plateau has come especially in the case of intermittent drought consequently the amount of water extracted up to the end of stage 2 determines cumulative growth by plants on a particular soil water reservoir research on soil water use in crop growth dating more than 100 years has consistently shown an intimate and stable relationship between the plant growth and transpirational water use after correcting for variation in atmospheric humidity reported by Sinclair and co-workers 1984 therefore options to enhance crop survival do not usually mean an increase in crop yield under drought conditions increase crop yields and water productivity require optimization of the physiological processes involved in critical stages mainly stage 2 of plant response to dehydration so in this case uh, breeders plant breeders need to come into picture who can control these mechanism through their breeding program by knowing what plant require what physiological changes are happening under these conditions now let us see some physiological aspects in relations to droughts or moisture deficit in different crops so target environments and crop sensitivity to drought so we will take case by case basis let us start with the palmillet palmillet is a very common crop in dryland areas particularly during a rainy season so post flowering also referred as terminal drought stress so terminal drought stress means post flowering after flowering whatever drought stress come that may be called as terminal stress 
so either alone or in combination with pre flowering drought is common in major pearl uh, millet growing environments in india so this terminal heat stress is very very uh, dangerous and it can reduce the yields flowering and grain filling periods are most sensitive to water stress in pearl millet so there should not be any deficit of water at flowering and grain filling stages yield reduction in this stage is due to decrease panicle number and grain mass usually the number of grains per panicle is less affected if terminal stress occurs after flowering the reduction in grain mass observed during terminal drought seems to be due to restriction of the assimilate supply rather than the reduction of the grain storage capacity so actually photosynthesis reduces supply reduces supply of carbohydrate reduces hence that the translocation cannot happen if you do not have photosynthesis in the leaves under very low water potentials uh, stomatal closure and a consequent reduction in photosynthetic activity has been reported in pearl millet however the supply of assimilates through the mobilization of stored soluble sugars can compensate for the impaired photosynthetic activity reported by fossil uh, co-workers 1980 the transfer of assimilates from leaves with the stems serving as a buffer during the grain development appears to be the main adaptation trait during terminal drought stress in pearl millet from a study involving normal and extended day length uh, mahalakshmi and bidinger 1985 suggested that photo period control of floral initiation can provide an escape mechanism to avoid the coincidence of mid season water stress with sensitive stages of millet growth and you know very well that sensitive stages are flowering and grain filling now see uh, some more information about sorghum terminal drought is the most limiting factor for sorghum production worldwide so again means drought after flowering is very very serious in india sorghum is grown during both raining and post rainy seasons the variable moisture environment during the rainy season can have a severe impact on grain and biomass yield affecting both pre flowering and post flowering stages climate variability and associated genotype environment interactions do not permit clear definition of the target environments opportunities to make progress in breeding for drought tolerance lie both in understanding the environmental control of crop growth and in developing simplified approaches to modeling drought or heat stress at the seedling stage often results in poor emergence plant death and reduced plant stand so particularly germination is affected during early stages and if germination is affected then emergence emergence means when seedlings comes out of the soil that is your emergence so seedling number will reduce severe pre flowering drought stress results in drastic reduction in grain yield most flowering drought stress tolerance is indicated when plants remain green and fill grain normally the stay green trait has been associated with post flowering drought in sorghum so drought at flowering commonly results in barrenness or in genotypes having a longer anthesis silking interval one of the main causes in reduction in the flux of assimilate to the developing ear below some threshold level necessary to sustain grain formation and growth drought coinciding with this growth period can cause serious yields instability at the farm level understanding the nature of the high higher grain potential and enhance yield stability especially in stress prone environments will provide opportunities to improve the selection of stress tolerant genotypes now switch over to maize inadequate water availability at critical stages of crop growth and development is the major limiting factor for maize production and productivity in the tropics so silking stage is very very important for moisture 
mean uh, rainfall during the crop season appears to be adequate for maize production, but its distribution during the crop cycle has a high coefficient of variability, means distribution is not fixed. Normal interseasonal fluctuations in rainfall have been found to be associated closely with variations in average national maize yields across quite large production regions in the tropics. The above suggests that water stress is the pervasive cause of yield instability in maize based cropping systems in the tropics. Now see groundnut is very very important grain legume and it is an oil seed crop and grown in dryland areas. The effect of drought on ground, groundnut is manifested in several ways affecting both quantity and quality of the crops. Quantity means the yield or production of biomass and quality means with respect to nutritional quality, protein content, vitamin, mineral, these, these are quality attributes or oil percent also. The three patterns of drought observed in groundnut are early season drought, mid season drought and end of season drought. A 20 to 25 day moisture stress early in the season once the crop is established and its subsequent release by irrigation or rainfall has been found to induce heavy and uniform flowering leading to increased productivity. So a very lighter water stress at early stage was beneficial here. Perhaps it has helped in increasing the root growth in search of water. Groundnut shows increased sensitivity to mid season stress compared with early and late season stresses. Yield progressively decreases as duration of the drought increases and as the mild season approaches. Water deficit during the late flowering and pod forming periods is detrimental to groundnut yield. Thus, these are very critical phases for grain yield of uh, groundnut. End of season drought affects seed development and its quality. Moisture stress timing and severity during flowering decreases the number of flowers and delays the time to flower. However, since only 15 to 20 percent of flowers form pods, reduction in flowering due to moisture stress does not directly influence pod yield. Also groundnut can compensate for reduced flower numbers arising from water deficits by producing a flush of flowers once the stress is over. Soil water deficits during pegging and pod set decrease yield primarily by reducing pod number rather than seed mass per pod, which is true only if there is sufficient water available for the production of assimilates at the later stage. The pod zone water content influences peg penetration and conversion into pores and calcium and water uptake by pores. Many of you might be knowing pegging. So, pegs are the structures from the, bay, from the flower after fertilization and these pegs enter into the soil and these pegs make the pores. So, you need to know in detail about what is pegging in groundnut. Now chickpea, chickpea is mostly a ravi season crop in the country and it does not face too much of uh, water deficit and it, it is mostly grown on residual soil moisture which was received during the rainy season. So characterizing drought in post rainy season crops such as chickpea is relatively simple compared with the intermittent drought experienced by the rainy season because here temperatures are also not too high. So as the crop is grown almost entirely on stored soil moisture, it is exposed mostly to progressively increasing water deficit or terminal water deficit may be there during the month of March or April. Factors governing crop growth and water use in the post rainy season that is radiation, temperature, vapor pressure and potential evaporation are relatively stable and predictable in this case. Hence simulation modeling of both crop uh, growth and the effects of various crop dates is uh, eminently feasible because in rabi seasons or winter season the climatic variables have less variability 
compared to the summer season or rainy season. Pigeon pea is your uh, Kejanus kejan or Arhar crop. It is also important in semi-arid and arid, arid climates. In pigeon pea growing Kharif season traits, the rainfall is erratic in its amount and distribution. However, based on the long-term rainfall pattern, it is possible to broadly characterize patterns of drought in a given environment by calculating probabilities of dry periods followed by wet periods or vice versa, reported by Virmani and co-workers 1982 from ICRI set. This assessment is helpful in developing genotypes for target environments or in identifying environments with similar drought patterns. Traditionally, medium to long duration land races of varieties have been cultivated with a crop duration of 150 to, to 300 days. It was really very, very long duration of the crop. Pigeon pea can be exposed to intermittent drought stress during dry periods of the rainy season and to terminal drought stress in post rainy season. Means uh, we are not sure this drought can come at any stage depending upon the distribution of the rainfall. Since the late 1980s, uh, short duration genotypes have, have been developed with extra short duration genotypes able to reach maturity within 90 days. However, most common are 120 days. However, the short duration genotypes are usually sensitive to intermittent drought. A pigeon pea simulation model by Robertson 2001 could also facilitate characterization of drought patterns for environments where long-term weather data is available. So by now, you have seen most of the things related to dryland, such as its meaning, concepts, and different constraints under dryland systems. And main constraint is your moisture, stress, and high temperature, high ET rates, poor soil, etc. You have seen, and you have also seen some physiological uh, principles under dryland system and particularly in different crops and you have found overall that under dryland conditions the yields and, and performance of the crops is generally low and it is low because of drought conditions, water deficit or high temperature etc. Now question comes how can we increase this yield, this biomass production, radiation use efficiency, water use efficiency and all sorts of issues how can we conserve the soil? So there are lot many things that can be done in under dry land conditions. So now we want to see dry land farming technology. What should be the techniques by which we can sustain the production in dry lands? So starting with timely preparatory and seeding operations including conservation of stored soil moisture is necessary. Whatever water is there, you cannot control the amount of rainfall or distribution of rainfall, what has been given by the nature that needs to be properly and efficiently utilized. So we must follow all sorts of measures by which we can increase the water use efficiency, water collection, storage and recycling. The use of improved crop varieties should be done which can withstand stresses. There are certain varieties and plant types which has been developed by plant breeder and they suit more to the dry, drying conditions and selection may be made for those cultivars or genotypes or varieties. Uh, for moisture conservation in the soil, number of options are there and the simple one is deep tillage, surface cultivation and stubble mulch, mulching need to be practiced. So deep tillage is not new concept, farmers are being advised and they are also practicing this deep tillage for a long time and it has several benefits particularly when your hard layer is there uh, then it can be broken down and there will be proper aeration and proper root growth and also water storage capacity will increase. If you have any hard pan layer then the soil depth is very low so water holding capacity of the soil is low but you break this uh, layer hard pan then you can increase the water holding capacity. And there are certain implements that can be used for breaking this hard pan and in that case chisel plow can also be used. So deep tillage is required to break plow soles and 
layers because repeated flowing over centuries has resulted in the growth of hard compacted layers. Conjunctive use of rainfall surface and ground water should be done. Conjuncting means joint use. It can be rainfall. Of course, rainfall will come at its own. You cannot control it. But surface and ground water should be used in combination to the what has been received from the rainfall. Surface sources may be your, your uh, canals, may be rivers, may be ponds, etc. Some are stored, uh, some water is stored after harvesting in the rainy season. And ground water, of course, some farmers have facility of the tube wells even under dry land conditions. Of course, the water table is very, very deep under those conditions, but if it is there, it should be used judiciously. Harvesting of water for use in dry period. So, water harvesting can be done at a small scale, at larger scale. At larger scale, it is possible by community efforts or, or still larger efforts, then you need support from the governments, state government or central government or local government, whatever it is, then this water can be recycled. And of course, watershed is a natural hydrological unit, is a good device for water harvesting. So, in these areas, water harvesting should be practiced and if it is done on watershed basis, then it becomes sustainable. Proper watershed management can stop not only further degradation of ecosystem, but degraded lands can also be restored. So, many times when rainfall come and it is uh, high in amount, then it goes at, as runoff, it goes as, as waste, but at the same time it, it is responsible for erosion also. Lot of soil can be carried if the area from which this rainfall is coming is not properly treated is not properly managed. Soil conservation by contour bonding, terracing, land sloping and land leveling and also by practicing conservation tillage can be done because uh, erosion problem is there in the watershed area or in the cropping areas, then certain practices can be followed under slopey conditions where you have slopes or hills or undulated areas. Practices like contour, contour bonding is very, very important, terracing, it is, it is quite common in certain uh, low hill areas, land sloping and land leveling. Land leveling has started in a good way in the country, many areas, now people are opting for land leveling. Now uh, as far as possible, drip irrigation should, system should be adopted because water scarcity is the number one problem in dry land. So, whatever water is available, but if it can be applied judiciously and efficiently, then we can uh, get uh, more yield per drop of water, which, which is also a motto of the government also. So, in this case, uh, drip system should be encouraged and some governments and state governments are giving subsidy on the drip irrigation system also and the efficiency of water is very high by drip irrigation system and there could be saving of say 40 to 60 percent water can be saved if we follow drip irrigation system. Lining of canals to minimize water, we have lot of canals in the country and water get wastage if, if the lining is not there. It can be by seepage or it can be by percolation. So, lining can be made by some bricks or by some polythene or by any other suitable uh, material so that water is not lost from the canals. Integrated nutrient management is uh, genuinely required because soils are mostly eroded soil or problem soils are there, saline, alkaline, salt affected soils are there. So, under those conditions, proper nutrient management is very, very important. Many times soils are deficient in nitrogen, phosphorus and some of the micronutrients. So, those should be supplemented in a balanced way by, by all the possible sources of nutrients maybe biofertilizer, maybe organic manures or maybe fertilizer. But fertilizer recommendation should be based upon the moisture availability. If moisture availability is low, you cannot use high quantity of fertilizers. Integrated weed management and integrated pest management. So, under these conditions also we get severe problem of weeds and also insect pests. Weeds uh, remove water, water is the precious commodity 
under these conditions. So, to conserve the water, we need to remove the weed. To, to protect our crop from competition with the weeds, we need to remove the weeds. So, anyway, integrated weed management practices should be followed in dry land areas, so that our crop do not face any competition with these unwanted plants. Similarly, insect pest damage should be controlled by integrated manner following crop rotations, having all kind of physical, mechanical and biological methods as far as possible and the best practices should be combined to control the insect pests and diseases under these conditions. For the non-farm operations, dry land areas have to be supplemented with non-farm occupation like animal husbandry, fishery, poultry, social forestry. So, now there is definitely a great scope of integrated farming systems where many enterprises can be combined with crop production like it can be fishery, it can be duckery, piggery, or it can be uh, other kind of enterprise like livestock production, your beekeeping, or your silkworm rearing, silk culture, um, or biogas plant is very, very important. So, uh, some of them can be combined depending upon the availability of the inputs and the infrastructure and the facilities. But that is going to be a very important uh, system of farming that can sustain the sustainability of the dryland farming. So, now it is definitely need of the hour to think on these lines. LA cropping, pasture management, tree farming, silvi pastoral management systems and agro horticultural systems which are more relevant to dryland situation have to be adopted for successful dryland farming system. In dryland farming also agroforestry is getting very, very important and if you take multi-purpose trees then uh, problem of fuel, wood, timber and uh, up to some extent vegetable can be sold and also such tree are responsible for carbon sequestration and some may fix nitrogen also because under most of the conditions multi-purpose trees are recommended for agroforestry system. So, this they may increase the, uh, the yield and as well as economics of the small farm holdings. Now, see in dry land, whatever rain is received, we, we should conserve it either into the soil or whenever it run off, it is run off or lost by run off, that should also be collected and that can be used as a life saving irrigation. So, let us see rain water management strategies and corresponding management options to improve crop yield and water productivity. So, first column is rain water management strategy then purpose and then management options. So, increase plant water availability XC2 external water harvesting system means outside the field how can we harvest the water. Purpose is to overcome the dry spell mitigation, dry spell mitigation, protective irrigation. Sometimes there is shortage of water and crop will die if water is not applied. That is very critical stage. At that critical stage, the protective irrigation can be applied. Some people call it supplemental irrigation and some call it life saving irrigation. Uh, spring protect protection, groundwater recharge and enable off season irrigation, multiple water use. So, if you collect the rain water then in the ponds or in any other suitable structure, then it also recharges your groundwater. That is good because next time your water table will be up. The management options are surface micro dams, subsurface tanks, farm ponds, percolation dams or tanks, diversion and recharging structure. Next is in situ water harvesting systems. In situ means within the field how can you harvest the water. So, purpose is to concentrate or runoff to cropped area means bring the uh, uh, water which you are going to lose by runoff back into the field or, or you do not allow the runoff. Uh, maximize rainfall infiltration into the soil. Uh, how it is possible? What can be done? Our field should be bunded. So, bunds, ridges, broad beds and furrows, micro basins, runoff strips, terracing, contour cultivation, conservation agriculture, dead furrows, staggered trenches. So, lot many management options are available and depending upon the availability of resources, 
one can try two or three or even more so that your maximum water is conserved right in the soil khet ka pani khet mein rain water management strategy evaporation management so purpose is reduce non productive evaporation so management options are dry planting early mulching is is good you can cover the soil it will protect from erosion as well as as well as it will conserve the uh, water and soil and also it will moderate the temperature reduce the temperature if your temperature is too high or other way it can increase the temperature also if it is low so mulching acts as a moderating material uh, conservation agriculture intercropping wind breaks agroforestry early plant vigor vegetative bunds optimum crop geometry these are the management options then increase plant water uptake capacity integrated soil and crop management purpose is increase proportion of water balance for uh, flowing as produce productive transpiration management options are improved crop varieties soil fertility optimum crop rotation pest control and organic matter uh, now let us see effect of climate variability on permulate permulate is just an example on crop performance it can be extended to other crops also so late onset of monsoon so what effect will happen on the crops so shorter rainy season risk that long cycle crops will run out of growing time and then early maturing varieties exploitation of photoperiodism phosphorus fertilizer at planting these are the options then if there is early drought so difficult crop establishment and need for partial or total re-sowing here so crop may fail so purpose is to save your crop from failing so phosphatic fertilizer at planting water harvesting and runoff control delayed sowing but poor growth due to nitrogen flush uh, exploit seedling heat and drought tolerance next is there may be mid season drought drought when your crop is growing right in the field so the purpose is uh, effect is poor seed setting and panicle development fewer productive tillers produ uh, reduce grain yield etc use of palm millet where uh, palm millet variability differing cycles high yielding cultivars uh, tilling cultivars optimal root traits and water harvesting and runoff control a uh, next climate variability can be terminal drought and poor grain filling fewer productive tillers adverse effect on the yield attributes early maturing varieties optimal root traits fertilizer at planting water harvesting and runoff control Uh, what will happen if there is excessive rainfall so in palm millet disease may be there downy mildew and other pests and nutrient leaching can also happen and resistance varieties pesticide nitrogen fertilizer so one need to follow some integrated approaches of insect pest management increased temperature poor crop establishment increased transpiration and faster growth so what can be done heat tolerance trait Uh, crop residue management phosphorus fertilizer at planting to increase plant vigor large number of seedlings per planting hill uh, unpredictability of drought stress so above uh, effect will be there same kind of effects can be there but most effects are really negative on crop growth development and productivity so what can be done phenotypic variability genetically diverse cultivars increase co2 level there is concern about carbon dioxide that it is increasing in the environment and it is also raising the temperature uh, which is uh, resulting in global warming and this global warming is causing climate changes so in that sense this carbon dioxide is increasing so what can it do it, it is favorable having favorable effect faster plant growth through increased photosynthesis but higher transpiration so it can promote positive effect of higher levels through better soil fertility management increase occurrence of dust storms at onset of rains so seedling buried and damaged by sand particles this can be very serious when when the storms are very uh, having very high impact so increase number of seedlings per planting hill mulching ridging can be done increase dust in the atmosphere 
So, it results in lower radiation and definitely reduce photosynthesis and you can do increase nutrient inputs. Now, overall the future outlooks are like major areas of concern in dry land agriculture which, which needs need due emphasis of all stakeholders, whether it is farmer, whether it is scientist or administ uh, administrator or policy makers, all have to come together to solve this problem because these kind of things are directly related to nation's food security. So, one concern that needs uh, thinking is proper marketing and price policy to cover crops and animal products because here the crop failures are, are quite frequent. So, some policy is required particularly this insurance policy should be extended. It is being ex extended but ensured that uh, farmers get uh, their crop insurance, uh, effective crop insurance and if crop fails they should get the return well. Conservation of soil and water resources as you have seen that soil and water are the two important natural resources. Under these conditions soil erosion is quite frequent because many times your land is barren, plants are not growing. Under those conditions wind erosion is too high uh, and it is uh, quite usual also and sometimes there can be excessive rainfall also which can carry the uh, soil particles along with it. So, water erosion is also possible. So, soil must be pro protected because this eroded soil is rich in nutrients, it is rich in microbes and also rich in organic matter. If we are losing this soil, we are losing nutrients and we are losing money also. So, this soil may be protected by following proper uh, techniques or proper method. Some of them have been discussed. Similarly, water is another important resource which needs to be conserved in dryland areas so that drought can be mitigated or problems related to drought can be sorted out. Similarly, there is need to develop some plant varieties which can suit directly to the dryland areas and also the seed of these varieties should be of good quality. The seed replacement rate is very low. Farmers mostly use their own saved seeds. So, they should get new and certified seed or good quality seed. Uh, this is also required and low cost and locally suited agricultural implements, implements can reduce the drudgery on the human la labor. So, proper implements should be given to the people there, particularly subsidies should be given to the farmers because they are not good in economic status. And definitely the extension education has a very important role and all the state or central uh, extension agencies which are concerned with agriculture or agricultural development should come uh, come forward and they should take technologies best technologies to the farmers so that the level of the farmers the economics of the farmer improves so hope you liked this lecture thank you very much